Like Rebecca said, it is officially the Christmas season, so now it is acceptable to begin to listen to Christmas music. Some of you in this room have been doing it since November 1st. And the way that some of you just got looks across the aisle, look down in shame, tells me exactly who it is. So you're monsters. Uh, it's time. You can listen to Christmas music now, though. Uh, guys, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Um, how many of you this weekend had to rearrange your living room to make room for your Christmas tree? Really? There you go. Less than I expected. That was what we did this weekend. Um, long weekends for the Lowry household just mean a lot of house projects. I don't know if it's that way for you guys, but that's how it is for us. Um, my wife, Jesse and I like to do all these house projects when we have the time. And I used to try to pretend that I was the guy that liked house projects, that I was kind of the, the handyman, that I could do it all. Uh, that lie died very quickly. I'm not that dude. I've never been that dude. But uh, when Jesse and I first got married, I tried to kind of pretend like I was that guy. Like I was like, I'll put on the face and see if I can watch some YouTube videos and learn, do all the things. Did not happen. When we moved into our first apartment together, I remember one time we, were, we had to hang these shelves over our couch. And I remember I looked at it and I kind of evaluated the situation. And I was like, okay, it's a shelf, two screws, not hard. I got this. And so I, I remember measuring the distance between the holes and I put the tape measure up on the wall and I you know, did what I could to level it and I marked the holes where I needed to screw. And right when I put the drill up to the wall, Jesse from behind me just goes, hey, I think I could help you with that if, if you would like some help. And I was like, nah, I got this. It's just two screws, easy. She goes, okay. So I drill these two screws in the wall and I like get it right, I mount the shelf and it looks like this, right? Like it's not, it's not close, it's not level. And I was like, well, it happens to the best of us. It'd be all right. So I take one of the screws out of the wall and I go to just kind of shimmy it up just a little bit to re-level. And Jesse, again, from behind me, very sweet, very kind, just goes, hey, I can help with this. If you just, if you need a hand, all you got to do is ask. And I was like, nah, this is fine. I got it. This just, this will fix it. So I get ready, level it, hit the other screw, put it on. And now it's like this, just other direction, crooked. And at this point, I'm like fuming, right? Like on the inside, not outside, trying to keep my cool, like, I know what I'm doing. I got this. It's fine. This happens all the time. And I don't turn around, but I feel like I can feel the smug smile on her face. And I don't turn around, but I like get ready to fix it. And a third time as I'm taking it off and going to relevel one of the, the levels, she goes, hey, I know a better way to do this. <laughs> she goes, I, I can help. Just let me help you. Do you think I took her help? Spot on. <laughs> I did not. I think the words that came out of my mouth were, I'm not an idiot. I know how to hang a shelf. <laughs> not my best move. So it does take like two or three more times for me to finally get the shelf level. And I do get it level for what that's worth. But I have like four extra holes in my drywall to show for it. But I do get it level and I like, we'll spackle that later. But I know I have another shelf to hang and I'm frustrated. And so I put the tools down and I like leave to cool off for a bit. And when I come back in the room five minutes later, I walk in and Jessie is sitting on the ground with the shelf on her lap. And I watch this scene take place where she, she takes painter's tape. She stretches it out, gets a strip and she puts it across the shelf where the, the holes are. And she pokes a hole where the screw goes and pokes a hole where the screw goes. She takes the tape off, puts it on the wall, levels it. Drills, drills, rips the tape off, hangs the shelf. It's the most level shelf I've ever seen in my entire life. It's the most level shelf that's ever been hung in history, I'm pretty sure. And she, I just watch this amazing thing take place in front of me. And I'm like, I'm, that's the way I'm gonna hang a shelf forever. That's the way I'm gonna hang anything forever. Now, that's, that's the only way to do that. Um, and if you don't take anything else from this morning, take that. It's a good life hack. But I watched this happen and two thoughts went through my head. The first one was astonishment at what I had just witnessed. Like, amazing. The second thing was shame, if I'm being honest with you, because I was so in my own way that I could not even stop to hear an opinion that wasn't my own. I, I was so in my own head about wanting to protect this identity, so wanting to like do things my own way, I, I couldn't even see this opinion that was contrary to my own. And if I had just taken two seconds and gone, sure, babe, what's your idea? She would have said it and I would have gone, that's the best idea ever. Why aren't we doing that right now? But I didn't. Uh, and so I had four extra walls in my dry, holes in my drywall to show for that. <laughs> I wasn't willing to submit to her in that moment. And I should have been. And so as we continue on in this series, we're ending it today, actually, this series on the one another's, we're gonna talk about what it looks like to submit to one another in the body of Christ. We're gonna talk about what submission looks like we're gonna talk about why it's so hard for us to submit in a lot of moments. 
And then we're gonna spend the bulk of our time today talking about how do we live a life that's marked by submission? How do we live a life that's characterized by a habit of mutually submitting to one another? So if you would, go ahead and turn to Ephesians 5 with me. We're actually gonna be in the same passage that we were last week, uh, but we're gonna look at it from a little bit of a different angle. So it's Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. And this is Paul. He's writing to a church not unlike ours, um, a church in Ephesus. And he has spent the first three chapters encouraging them in the gospel that this is your identity. This is who you are. And now the back back three chapters are in light of the gospel. Here's how we should then treat each other. Here's how we should live. So Ephesians 5, 15 through 21, Paul says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So Paul is encouraging the Ephesians, this church, and us to make a habit out of submitting to one another. If you continue reading, we're not gonna go here today, but he talks about what submission looks like in the following passage in a bunch of different specific relationships. But here's the gist of what he says about submission. Submission is dying to our desires, our preferences, our agendas, and our idols for the sake of another person because of our devotion to Jesus. I'll say that again. Submission is dying to our desires, our preferences, our agendas, and our idols for the sake of another person because of our devotion to Jesus. When we run into conflict with one another, when our preferences butt up against someone else's preferences, when we, maybe on a Black Friday, plan to sit down and sleep in and then wake up and watch football and everybody else wants to wake up and go shop early, our thought should not first be of ourselves. Our thought should be to die to ourselves, to look to the hopes of others and lift them up higher than we lift ourselves. Submission should be the hallmark of the Christian life. And as we're in this community of believers with one another, whether that's in the body of Christ, whether that's with our families, with our friends, we should all be mutually submitting to one another. We should all look out for each other more than we look out for ourselves. That's the way that we should live. That's the way God calls us to live. But unfortunately, that's not our reality. We're, we're not very good at this. As, as humans, submitting is actually one of the hardest things that we do. None of us like to defer to other people. None of us like to give up what we want for the sake of somebody else. We all like to get our way. And there's a ton of reasons that we fight submission. Maybe it's because we feel the need to to stand up for ourselves, right? Like we don't don't wanna be a doormat. We don't want people to walk up or walk all over us. So we fight against submission because we don't wanna be walked on. Maybe it's that we need to prove that we're independent, right? That we we don't want to admit that we might need somebody else's help. So when they offer it, we, we resist it. We don't want to submit our way of doing things. Maybe we like to be in control. We need to be the one to lead. And so we don't want to submit because that means letting somebody else have control, letting somebody else lead. Maybe you ran into some of those things at Thanksgiving this past week. You know, a lot of us had family over. Some of them, you know, could be sitting next to you right now before they hop on a plane and go home. Uh, By the way, if you're, this is your first time here, if you're visiting, so glad you're here. Very thankful you're here. Sorry if I'm putting you in a hard spot right now. Glad you're here. (laughs) But let's be honest, when you bring a group of people into a small space for a long weekend, you're not always gonna agree with each other on everything. Um, Someone's way of life is getting disrupted. Someone's way of doing things is getting disrupted. And our preferences, our way of doing things, brush up against other people's, especially in situations like this. You may have entered into conflict with somebody this week and fought to get your way. Submission could have been the furthest thing from your mind (laughs) because when our way of doing things is challenged, we resist that urge to submit and we fight. 
whether that's out loud, whether that's like genuine vocal conflict, or we fight silently in our hearts, right? Where we build up that silent argument in our heads. Like, I just wish they'd say that to me so I could say this thing back. We fight. And here's the hard part. When we resist submitting to one another, we're actually resisting closeness with each other. We're resisting what our relationships could be. Because submitting to other people allows us to like look outside of ourselves. It allows us to see people the way that God intends us to see people. It gets our eyes off of us and allows us to engage with people in a way that looks like Jesus. So by, by choosing to lay down our desire to be right, our desire to have things go our way, our desire to have our preferences met, our desire for validation, you know, that opens up the door for genuine closeness with those around us. And those types of relationships, that type of life is worth fighting for. Genuine relationships, those are something that, that God's gifted us with. He didn't have to, but he, he chose to give us genuine, authentic, close relationships with each other because of what Jesus did and through what Jesus did. So we get to live into those relationships when we learn what it looks like to mutually submit to one another. So how do we live a life that's marked by this type of submission? The first thing that we see in this passage is to be filled with the spirit. If you look at verse 18 again, it says, and do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit. And Paul tells us that being filled with the spirit is the only way that we can live a life marked by submission. It's the only way that we can really do any of the things in verses 11, uh, 19 through 20. We need to be filled with the spirit to address other people in the way that God would call us to. We need him to, to help us do it. And Paul uses a lot of contrasting examples in this passage to help communicate that to us. He says, don't be unwise, but be wise. Very descriptive. Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. He says, don't get drunk, don't be drunk, but be filled with the spirit. And it's, as we've been going through this series, it's the put off, put on language, right, that we've been seeing through this whole series. But there's a thematic through line in each of these examples that Paul gives. And it's this put off being selfish and put on looking to others first. Paul knows that we're tempted to be selfish with how we live, to live a life that's unwise, it's, in my mind, I think this like ignorance is bliss type life, right? Where like you, you know that things may be different than how you see them, but you're choosing to not see them, right? You're choosing to be willfully ignorant. And that's fair because to go from being unwise to wise, to gain wisdom means that you have to change and nobody likes change. Change is hard because it requires seeing yourself rightly to know if you need to make a change or not. And it's really hard to sit and go ask the question, how do I come across to other people and be willing to hear what the answer is? None of us wanna change because it's easier to not. And so Paul knows that we're tempted to live unwise instead of wise. To be foolish, to live foolishly is to have no regard for how what you do affects anybody else. To be drunk, right? It's to be out of control, to numb yourself to, to choose to become unhelpful to those around you. You know, you're making a choice to be numb to the world around you, to the people around you. Uh, one of the fathers of our faith, Augustine, uh, he's a theologian, said it this way. When he was describing human behavior outside of Christ, he said, humans are homo incurvatus in se. A little Latin for you on this Sunday morning. Homo incurvatus in se, which means that humans left to their own devices, we are humans turned inward on ourselves. It's our natural state. The only thing we wanna submit to is our own will, our own desire, you know, our own agenda. We submit to ourselves and that's pretty much it, just us. In order for us to not be turned in on ourselves, to turn out and see the world, see other people, see, even see ourselves correctly, we need something outside of us. The, the answer for how to see people rightly is not deeper in us. We need something outside of us and that's the spirit. Having the spirit in us shows us 
uh, the, the reality of our lives. It shows us how we can see other people rightly, how we can mutually submit to one another. And this idea of being filled with the Spirit in Scripture happens in a couple of different ways. The first one um, is the one you might think of. It's when we're saved at the moment of salvation, when we trust in Jesus, what he did on the cross for us as our righteousness, when we trust in that, God gifts us the, the Holy Spirit. We are filled with the Spirit in that moment. And the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our salvation there, right? If you have the Spirit in you, you are saved, full stop. But as we read Acts, we see a few stories where the disciples are continually being filled with the Spirit. And what that is, is when we pray to the Holy Spirit and ask him to help us fight our sin, when we pray to him and ask him to help us see others rightly, help us submit to one another, he is good to fill us and help us do that. God wants to aid us in those moments. He wants to help us turn outward to see other people. And he promises to fill us in those moments, to help us in those moments when we pray to him. And it's interesting here, I think in this passage that being filled with the spirit, when it talks about that, that it's contrasted with drunkenness, that it's contrasted with being drunk. And as, as Baptists, let's be honest, our history has kind of, has been to demonize alcohol in a way. And that's not what Paul's speaking about here. He's, he's not demonizing alcohol. He's not putting a ban on alcohol. He's saying, do not be drunk. He's saying, he's warning us against things in this life that can take our focus away, that can cloud our judgment. Because in order to submit to one another, we need to see each other rightly. If we're not seeing the needs of other people, if we're not hearing other people, how could we submit to them? Alcohol doesn't enhance us seeing people's needs. <laughs> it clouds it. I could though say the same thing about entertainment. Could say the same thing about social media, sports, even self-care. I could say that about. If we give any of those things a large piece of our heart, any of those things could cloud our vision of somebody else. When we give any of those things too big a piece of us, our life becomes about us. It doesn't become about the people who God's put in our lives for us to love. So we need to be careful when it comes to all these things. We need to live a life focused, using the lens of the spirit to see other people around us rightly. We're not called to numb our way through this life with entertainment or with alcohol. We're called to see each other clearly. I do wanna say really quickly as we hit this passage on alcohol that struggling with alcohol and alcohol addiction is it's a very common thing. Um, God knew that as humans, we would struggle with this. Some of us would and he knows that and he hurts for us in that. And so I just wanna say, if, if that's you in the room, if that's something that you wrestle with and you need help, we would love to step into that with you. We would love to, to help equip you with the means to fight that battle, whether that's through counseling or through a connection with a pastor. Know that we want to step into that with you because we care for you um, and we don't want to see that sin hurt you anymore. I also wanna say that if you do struggle with alcohol and you're doing the work, if you're, you're going to counseling, if you're in AA, if you're wrestling with this sin, know that God is glorified in your wrestle. Know that he is glorified as you struggle to fight this thing. Know that he is with you in that, he is for you in that, and he's proud of you in that as you fight through that sin. There's one beautiful difference I love in this comparison of, of being drunk versus being filled with the spirit. When you look at the Greek in this, this sentence, the being drunk, the way the, the verb is phrased, it's an active thing. So it's when you partake in that, you're actively choosing to engage in it. You choose to take the drink, all of that. But when it flips to the being filled with the spirit, the way that verb is phrased, it's passive. As we are filled with the spirit as believers, it's not something that we like make happen for ourselves. It's not something we have to churn up and grow and make happen it says that God is good to fill us. And what we do is we receive. It's like, essentially we're a sponge and the Holy Spirit is the water. You know, when water hits a sponge, it can't help but absorb, right? It, it does nothing to take in the water, it just happens. God the Father does that for us. He pours out his spirit on us at the moment of salvation and continually the more we need it. And we get to soak it up 
passively, we take it in, we receive this gift of God and we get to then go pour out uh, what God has given us. We need this filling of the spirit before we can live a life that's marked by submission. That's part of the how we do it. The spirit, thankfully, uh, also gives us the wisdom to know when to submit to other people. Because I know as I was prepping this, that question went through my mind of like, well, do we always submit to the will of somebody else? You know, sometimes shouldn't we, we fight, especially if we're fighting for a godly thing. Remember, submission, it's dying to our desires, our preferences, our agendas, our idols for somebody else because of Jesus. And so submission in a moment is really all about our heart motivations and our idols, And so in a moment of conflict with somebody else, in a moment where your preferences are rubbing up against somebody else's, a really good question to ask in that moment when you feel yourself kind of gearing up to fight is, hey, by fighting this, what am I protecting? What am I protecting by not submitting in this moment? Are you protecting something God glorifying, right? Are you protecting something God says is good? Or are you protecting your image? Are you, are you protecting your need for control? Are you, are you protecting your need to be independent? Just full transparency with you guys. I was prepping this sermon this week and I wanted to be done by like Tuesday, Wednesday because Thanksgiving and I didn't wanna have to think about it during the holiday. And so I finished it and I pulled it back out yesterday. Um, and as I was reading through it, I wanted Jesse to read through it and just say, hey, can you just make sure this all makes sense that I'm thinking rightly, all this stuff. She goes, sure. And so she took it and read it And she came back and she said, hey, love it. Content looks great. She said, but the first like 20 minutes, like could use some rearranging. Thank you for that laugh. (laughs) That's how I felt. I was like, what do you mean? But Jessie went to seminary. She's very smart. She's way smarter than me. And so she read it. And so in my heart, I felt two things. One, I know she's probably right. And I'd be better for it to listen. Two, I felt anger. (laughs) because it was Saturday and I had done all this work on the front end so I wouldn't have to work anymore. And so I really didn't hear what she said. All I heard was, you have more work to do. And so in that moment, I did not submit. I fought. I said, I don't think you're right. I think I got this. And we had a conflict about it. And we ended up needing to like take a breath. And I I asked myself this question. I said, what are you protecting by not submitting here? And I was protecting my need to be right. I was not protecting a really good sermon. I wasn't, I promise. Um, I was protecting my need to be independent. I was protecting my need for validation in a moment. And so when she came back, I had to apologize because I said, I didn't submit to you, not for a godly reason, but it was because of me. It was because I idolized me in that moment. Author Paul Tripp says that you can know if something's an idol in your life if you're willing to sin to get it. You can know if something's an idol if you're willing to sin to get it. And in that moment, I idolized me. And if you guys, if you're willing to fight against someone in your life and not submit to them, you could be protecting an idol. Ask yourself what you're protecting. And praise God, the spirit is good as we pray and ask him to reveal the idols of our heart, as we ask him to help us see ourselves rightly, see the things we're idolizing, he's, he's good to help us. And he's good to reveal those things to us and help us get rid of them so that we can receive something far greater, genuine relationship with each other, genuine relationship and genuine closeness with God and with those around us. The next way that we can live a life marked by submission is to be present in your community. Being filled with the spirit changes our inner life, our heart life, which is an amazing thing. But it also changes how others experience you as well. Paul's writing this letter to a church, not unlike ours. And he says that when we are filled with the spirit, that's gonna be felt by the community around us. That when we're filled with the spirit, what's gonna flow out of us as a body of Christ is joy. Joy about being an active member of God's family. You know, as we come in, for us at PCBC, like this should be the place we look forward to being at every week, right? This is the place where we get to experience each other as a family, where we get to have the type of relationship with each other that in every other sphere of our lives, we don't get. 
There's not another place in our lives where we get this type of fellowship, where we get this type of community. And when we look at what's listed in verses 19 and 20, the addressing one another with psalms and hymns, singing to the Lord together, giving thanks to God, submitting to one another. With each of those things, Paul's describing them in the context of the church. And so we can't do any of those things on our own. We can't do any of those things apart from the community of God. We need to be present in this community that he's giving us because without knowing each other truly, without focusing on each other, we can't live a life of submission. It's not possible. And it's easy, I'll be honest, to to come to church on a Sunday morning, right? To get off the elevator, come in here, take your seat, hear a sermon, and then hit the elevator and go right back down to the parking garage. It's that elevator makes it very easy (laughs) to have to see very few people. Uh, We've got to be intentional about being a part of the body of Christ. And it's not easy. But when you aren't engaged with the community that God's given us with the rest of the body, you're missing out on deep relationships that God wants to give you. It's a gift that he has to offer us. He is wanting to give you deep, genuine fellowship with each other. But sometimes we don't take it. We don't take his word for it. But these types of relationships, these genuine, deep fellowship level relationships take place when we know each other, when we're present in the body of Christ and when we're willing to mutually submit to one another. What flows out of us is joy. And when we we come together, that joy should be so palpable that we can't help but sing praises to God, right? That we can't help but thank him for what he's done in our lives, for what he's done in the lives of the people that we love. You know, we shouldn't be able to stop thanking him and lifting up our praises to him. Han taught on this passage last week and he did a great job talking about what worship is and how what Paul describes in these verses, 19 and 20, should be our lived experience each week. We get to come together every week and be with our collective family and praise God together. In the same way, we shouldn't be able to help submitting to one another out of reverence for Jesus. For us at PCBC, that could look like when you go to connect group um, and you sit down and that one person who you always disagrees with, who you always disagree with, disagrees with you again. And it could be about the Bible or the Cowboys. It doesn't matter. We all know those people who we disagree with about everything. (laughs) Submission in that moment might look like dying to your need to be right. It might look like dying to your need to win, assuming the best about that other person because we're brothers and sisters in the faith. Submission in our body could be like when leadership makes a decision that you're not sure about. Um, And this is to me too. When they make decisions we're not sure about, trusting and submitting to the authority that God's given us is a good and God-honoring thing. And that can actually, when we trust, when we submit, that can lead to further trust in our authority, further trust in God. That's a good thing. Students, kids in the room, submission for you can look like today when you go home and all you wanna do is take a nap, and all I wanna do is take a nap, fair. But when all you wanna do is take a nap and one of two things happens, your parents ask you to do chores or your sibling says, hey, can we play that game that you hate? Submission might be saying, yeah, I'll play the game or yeah, I'll do the chore. Because by dying to yourself in that moment and by putting others above you, you're gonna gain a closeness with each other that will last a lifetime. Mutual submission to each other is the hallmark of the Christian church. And that's true for relationships at every level of authority. Um, Again, if you continue on to the next passage, Paul talks about submission in a few different relationships. And we're not gonna go here, but what we see is that there's always moments where there's somebody above us in terms of authority, and there's always someone below us in terms of authority. There's always someone older than us. There's always someone younger than us. You know, we've all got parents Some of you have kids. There's other people's kids. We've got bosses, we've got roommates, we've got mentors, mentees, all the different relational types. And for the most part, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. There's an author, theologian named Francis Folks who says there must be a willingness in the Christian fellowship to serve anyone, to learn from anyone, and to be corrected by anyone regardless of age, sex, class, or any other division. 
There's gotta be a willingness to serve anybody, learn from anybody, be corrected by anybody, regardless of anything. We've gotta be willing to die to ourselves, to die to our image, and be willing to submit to any type of person around us. And we get to do this. We get to treat each other this way because we're family, because of what God has done for us. We get to lay down our lives for each other. And ultimately, we do this because of the reverence that we have for Jesus and because of our realization of what he's done for us. Which brings us to our last point. The last way to live a life marked by submission is to submit to God's righteousness. When Jesus died for us on the cross, God imputed Jesus' righteousness to us. And when we trust in that righteousness, we are submitting to that righteousness. And what that means is that we submit to creating an image for ourselves. We submit to trying to work out our own salvation for ourselves. We submit to trying to be good enough to earn God's love or to earn each other's love because we don't have to play that game anymore. When we submit to God's righteousness, when we trust in the gospel, there is nothing for us to prove anymore. Our identity is locked and secure with Jesus as a child of God. And he says that about us forever. And he says that about each of us forever, ever, both as individuals and as a community. I heard somebody say one time, if the gospel is true, what do you have to prove anymore? What do you have to protect? Nothing. We're secure in Christ. We are secure with Jesus's righteousness. And so we get to mutually submit to one another because we're not the king and queen of our lives anymore. God's the king. Our whole life is now about glorifying him, serving him together, and we get to serve one another as well as we glorify God together, as we serve God together. And so as we worship, um, I'd love for you guys to think about a person in your life who you've struggled to submit to, or maybe a time this past week where you struggled with that inner dialogue, where you struggled with that fight. Think about how God submitted himself to death for us so that we can learn what it looked like to submit to each other. Ask God to reveal to you what your idols may be. And go home and maybe have a hard conversation. God's good to meet us there too. We need those. So let's continue to worship this God who's good, who submitted himself for us.